Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to Reading with Raptors on a kind of cold and dreary here in Minnesota, Tuesday morning. Um, it was pretty cold last night, so I brought this American Kestrel in and he was sitting here and doing such an amazing job that right before we started, I wanted to give him a small chunk of mouse to get started on ripping apart. And instead of actually eating it, he's uh, doing what's called mantling, which is standing on top of the food and doing this kind of posturing that you're seeing now where he's kind of holding his wings over it and also is vocalizing. So <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit different than maybe how I thought that was going to go. So he's just gonna vocalize here for a few minutes. Um, <laughs> I tried just like walking away for a minute to let him kind of get started. So maybe I'll just like take a step over to the side, give him a little bit of space to maybe work on that a little bit. <laughs> maybe not ha having me standing right there will help. Possibly in the meantime, what I'll do is maybe just like turn the camera over and give him a little bit of space so we can start reading. I thought it was going to be so cool to have him start eating some food, but maybe we'll just start reading over here and let him get started without me standing right next to him. And then that will be <laughs> a good spot for him to start eating and then we can talk about him a little bit more just so I'm not standing right next to him and being a little bit stressful while he's eating. We'll just kind of stand over here. A great start to our morning. <laughs> I just feel bad. I don't want to stress him out while I'm standing right there. If he feels like he needs to kind of like protect that food from me, maybe trying to grab it or anything like that. So, so I'm just kind of giving him a little bit of space. I just feel bad because he was standing super comfortably and very fluffy and relaxed right before we started filming. So I feel kind of silly for doing that. <laughs> so welcome everybody. We will talk about our American Kestrel maybe once he starts eating um, instead of mantling over his food. Cause again, we don't, I don't want to cause him any undue stress. So in the meantime, let's get started reading. Um, if frogs made weather, because here, at least in kind of the whole kind of central corridor of North America over this weekend, we had a really big shift in weather. We went from kind of fall weather to this, or kind of summer weather to some pretty intense late fall winter. I know here in Minnesota, at least, we're barely getting over 50 degrees today. Um, so really, really chilly. I know folks down in more of like the Colorado area are getting winter storm warnings today. So. We're going to talk about the weather and how it changes. You can hear the effects of the weather in this very, um, very hungry American Kestrel who's making noise just right off camera. And we'll get back to him in a few minutes. Um, maybe once he starts eating a little bit, but he is still kind of standing there. So maybe if I just kind of ignore that for a little bit and let him work on that, we'll get started. So this is If Frogs Made Weather. This is by Marion Dane Bauer, illustrated by Dorothy Donahue. And it's, as you can see, this very wonderful kind of cut paper art that we've been seeing a bit of on Reading with Raptors. I'm a big fan. Before we get started, I'll just show you what he's up to right now without knocking over. Here's what he's up to. So hopefully he'll get started on eating his food here in a minute. Like I said, we're just giving him a little bit of space by me standing over here a little bit so he can get started on that piece of food that I handed him right before we turned on the live video. So we'll let him kind of work on that for a minute. But this is If Frogs Made Weather. This one is kind of the dedication page, but there is a small child with a frog jumping away out in the rain. If frogs made weather, morning would sprinkle, afternoon would drip, night would whisper, whisper to the brimming ponds. Did you know that frogs make weather? So here we have 
small child looking on at these frogs out enjoying the rain, sitting on lily pads, looking very content. I think this frog looks pretty content with what's going on. Just eat the food. <laughs> if weasels made weather, fog would cling to the ground, grip the grass, if weasels made weather, mist would hide the slink, conceal the pounce. Breakfast. So you can see our friend over here hiding in the grass. And here is a weasel sneaking up out of those misty grasses, sneaking up on that frog. If robins made weather, Trees would always be budding, the grass fresh and green, and the melting snow would set every worm a-wiggling. Here's the feet of our friend. And here we have a robin feeding a worm. Sorry, I'm trying to get the glare of the lights out. Whoa. There we go. There's robin feeding its chicks a worm. Every time I look over, he goes from standing kind of upright and looking at the food to fully mantling over the food. So that's why I haven't turned the camera back over. I wanted to start eating. If cats made weather, sun would slant in every window, spy beneath each bush, warm a spot for a tight tucked nap, warm a spot for a stretch. Here's a cat and a hand coming into pet. There's that nice big yellow sun warming everything. Very sleepy cat. If flies made weather, every day would be hot, hot, hot. And all the food would rot, rot, rot. And every fly would buzz. So here's our friend looking on at the pie that <laughs> these flies are all going after. I love how they do the cut paper for this little mop of hair. Here's a visual update on our bird. We uh, are kind of standing doing the exact same thing as we were earlier. I don't think he's progressed on the food at all. What do you think? Can we read over here? Hand him a little piece of food, maybe that'll get him working on it a little bit. There we go. He needs a little piece of food. Maybe we'll work on the big piece of food now. Nope. <laughs> He's kind of come over here. Yeah, we'll give him a second. Otherwise, I'll see if I can like step him up and just have him eat on the glove, maybe. <sighs> I just feel very silly about it. <laughs> because he was standing very comfortably until I handed him food. And I thought he would be hungry, but, yeah, and he is, but I thought he would want to just eat it right away rather than kind of display over it. So, it's my mistake. If turtles made weather, lightning would crash and smash and sizzle. Turtles would snap their doors shut and smile in the dry dark. So here is a turtle. Oh, I love the texture on this kind of draw or on the um, art on this one. You can see it's sitting inside of its nice dry shell. With all that nice texture on it to protect it from all of the weather. If bats made weather, the sun would sink, the wind would still, every mosquito would hum its fill and all the bats would be full of mosquitoes. So here we have our bats flying through that night sky looking for mosquitoes. Here we have our friends down here watching as all of the bats are looking for their mosquito dinners. I love on the bats. It looks like almost like a burlap fabric. I don't know how they made it, but it looks like some sort of Really cool, fibery material. If hawks made weather, the wind would blow and blow. 
rising and rising, swirling and swirling. Hawks would stretch their wings and drift, drift down. So here we have our hawk flying up in the air. You can see its beautiful feather texture and it's spiraling down below with the uh, warm air as the wind is blowing around able to spiral down. If geese made weather, this is this time of year, if geese made weather, leaves would flare in the bright blue air, frost would tip the lawn, and the sky would sigh with the lonely cry of going, going, gone. So here are these geese leaving on their annual migration with the leaves in the background. So our friend here looks on. I love how the grass is all cut paper too. That's really fun. If polar bears made weather, snow would pelt. Snow would sting. Snow would pile and drift and cling. If polar bears made weather, we would never see spring. Here's that big fluffy polar bear. Big piles of snow. Our friends all bundled up here in the corner making a a snow bear. If I made weather, I would call the slanting sun to my bed. I would tiptoe through the fog. I would blow the day clear with a mighty wind. Here's our friend blowing the wind. And here are all of those animal friends. We were just talking about the weather that all of them love. I would leave my footprints in the damp new earth and twirl the leaves to their beds. I would bask in heat and rejoice in snow. We are walking out in some big leaves with all of our animal friends walking behind us, enjoying all those different kinds of weather. I would snuggle in my mama's lap to hear the lightning roar. And I would stay counting the drip, drip, drip. So here is a big stormy weather outside the window with lightning and the rain. And look at all of our animal friends. They look like puppets or stuffed animals. We're playing with our stuffed animals during a big, big storm. And when the sun slid down the sky, I would greet the sweet nightfall. So here we are going to sleep in our nice cozy bed as the sun goes down below the horizon for nighttime. So we can have our owls and our bats outside. Here, I love this on the blanket here are all of the little animals that we were seeing. There's a turtle and a frog and a bat and a hawk. We have all those different animals on the blanket. If I made weather, we would have it all. So here are more of those stuffed animal friends. I really liked this book for today because as we're thinking about the changing of the seasons, at least here in North America and for kind of the central part of North America where we're really starting to see that fall weather, I think it's really nice to think about how important all these weather changes are during the year because at least for me today I was kind of sad that it got really cold and kind of dreary outside but it's really important that we have all these changing seasons for all of our wildlife outside it's time for migration it's time for leaves to change all sorts of stuff so I'm gonna move this over because he still hasn't started really eating and I feel bad that we haven't really been seeing him much well, he is totally turned around at least. I will point out on his tail feathers here. He's got these new tail feathers growing in on the sides. So this is another important part of changing seasons is that we're finishing out the molting season that all of our birds are kind of going through where he lost his old tail feathers and grew in new ones and he's just finishing growing these new tail feathers in. 
So you can see kind of along the sides, he's got those new tail feathers that are coming in still. So they're shorter than the other ones. So he's still kind of working on those, kind of growing in. It looks like all of his wing feathers, I think, are pretty much grown in when I saw them earlier. And then all of his other body feathers look like they've pretty much grown in by now. I think it's just the last couple of tail feathers that we're still working on. I'm not really quite sure what to do with him. I want you to be able to see him a little bit better, but um, he's pretty well turned around. So I'm just gonna stay kind of over here and talk a little bit. Well, he hopefully starts working on that piece of mouse. He is, so every morning we weigh, especially these small birds. So American kestrels like this one here, um, they weigh a, between kind of 100 to 115 grams, which is a little bit under a quarter of a pound. So that's about, about the same as one stick of butter. If you um, have a, a stick of butter in your fridge right now, you can kind of pick that up to feel about how much this bird weighs. So we weigh them every morning to make sure that they're doing well and making sure that they're getting enough food or that they're getting the right amount of food. And so when I weighed this bird this morning, his weight was kind of low compared to what it normally is. Um, just more, uh, I think this morning he was 106 grams. Normally he's about 112 to 115. So I figured that he was probably pretty hungry. Seemed pretty interested in the food that I was giving him, especially with that colder weather suddenly coming in. You need a little bit more food to kind of keep your weight up when you're staying outside and it's getting pretty cold. So when I handed him this piece of food, I thought that he would start ripping it up right away. Because that's what I want to do if I get my food and it's really cold and I'm really hungry is I just want to eat it right away. But instead he's kind of um, making sure that if there were any other American kestrels around, they wouldn't be able to see it and take it. Or if there were any other small animals around to try to grab and take his food. And certainly so I don't try to grab and take his food. Which I know that I don't want to do that because I do not eat mice. But doesn't know that maybe so I think that's why he's doing what he's doing right now instead of just working on eating that food right away which I thought is what he was gonna do so we're seeing some very interesting cool behavior <laughs> um, from this American kestrel right now someone asking a great kind of related question is how do our education kestrels do during migration season do they get restless um, I think normally what we normally see more um, kind of what I might describe as restlessness. So kind of higher activity, um, kind of uh, more interest in doing lots of different kind of behaviors. I normally see more during the springtime. I think during that nesting season, at least for this male American kestrel, um, we see more kind of activity during that springtime, especially because he has kind of a big kind of fake tree with kind of a warm heater area inside of it. So we'll see him going in there more and doing more kind of mating, kind of nesting displays in there. So all of the, the noises that an American kestrel male might make in the wild to try to attract a female. We'll see a lot more of that kind of at that springtime season, not so much during the fall. I don't think there's too much of a big difference. Normally also, and I'm actually really interested to see this year what it's like, is normally fall, um, especially right now as we are just past Labor Day, Normally this is when we go from doing lots and lots and lots of busy programs and seeing lots of people all summer long to kind of suddenly being able to relax a little bit as far as the birds go. Um, they usually go from seeing a lot of people every day to not seeing very many for most of the month of September. So I am actually really curious to see if their behavior is different during this kind of migration season now that we haven't just had that really big kind of busy program season as much as we have in the past. So. I'm very curious to see um, what that's like. So really a question, Emily. Um, yeah, really curious to see if that's a little bit different this year since we don't have the kind of programs and things happening as much. Um, someone also asked about Kestrel seeing ultraviolet light from urine, specifically mouse urine. Um, can other raptors see it? So there was a, a been a few actually I believe studies on specifically the common Kestrel or the European Kestrel. Um, which is actually a surprisingly distant cousin to the American kestrel. Um, the word kestrel, <laughs> the word kestrel really just means a small falcon. So all of the kestrels of Europe and Asia, and I believe Northern Africa also has some kestrels or birds that are called kestrels living there. Um, those are all relatively closely related. They're kind of like cousins. 
Um, whereas the American kestrel is pretty distant actually to those other kestrels. So we know that our European kestrels um, can see or have we have some evidence that they can use that ultraviolet light and that vision of being able to see mouse urine in fields, that they can use that for hunting. But our American kestrels, we don't actually have any good studies or evidence to show that. Um, so really interesting evidence from um, some other species, but not uh, closely enough related to American kestrels, I think, to make, say anything definitive about if they can see that ultraviolet light or not. Um, so yeah, still, still kind of a, a question for science to kind of work on and research. There are lots of birds out there that can see ultraviolet light, um, so they can see colors that we really can't see. Um, I know there's been a lot of really excellent work with hummingbirds specifically and looking at what they might be able to see on a flower that might look different than it does to us. Um, we also know that a lot of birds are able to kind of tell the difference between colors that we can't tell the difference between. But for actual, for American kestrels or for other larger raptors, there's not a ton of really good research on the color ability that they have of being able to see or kind of distinguish between colors. Most of that work has been done in other species of birds like chickens, or for example, or some songbirds, starlings, things like that. So not a ton of research into what these birds are really totally capable of seeing in terms of colors. So that's something maybe for if we have any young scientists who are interested in thinking of all the different things that we can research with these birds. I think that's definitely one of them is can American kestrels see some ultraviolet light? We don't really know. I think it would be really interesting to find out. Sorry, every time I move my hands. I think those are all the questions that I saw. Oh, someone in the someone in the chat is a big fan of hummingbirds, which is excellent. Um, I will say, actually, um, from our friends at the Wildlife Rehab Center, also here in the Twin Cities area, um, right now is some major hummingbird migration time. Um, they are very, very active. If you have hummingbird feeders up right now, definitely keep those up and keep them filled. Um, we have lots of hummingbirds who are heading down both from Canada through, especially the Twin Cities area, kind of along that main migration route between Duluth and the Twin Cities, kind of following down the Mississippi River. Uh, definitely keep those nice and full for the next several weeks here because um, we're going to have a lot of hummingbirds coming through and not as many flowers for them to, um, to eat from. So definitely keep those hummingbird feeders up so we can supply them with the energy that they need to get down to the Gulf Coast and beyond down into Central and South America, depending on where they're heading. So if you've got hummingbirds in your area, keep those feeders up. It's super important. Um, major migration times also starting up for American kestrels as well. Um, another reason why I thought this bird would def definitely be very interested in eating food. This is the time of year where they gotta really stock up um, and eat a lot of food to be able to um, you know, make that migration. American kestrels are usually following the migration of the darner dragonfly, which is that very large kind of bright green dragonfly that you can see here in kind of the upper Midwest. They'll normally follow that migration south I always think that it's kind of like if you go on a road trip and you have to stop and get some fast food, um, that you can <laughs> that you can stop and get some fast food on the way instead of bringing it with you. And American kestrels do a similar thing with those darner dragonflies, so they can catch them while they're flying, be able to eat them quickly, and keep on traveling. So they're able to make that journey in pretty quick time without having to stop and hunt so much. So they're able to follow those darner dragonflies. Someone in the chat also pointing out that sometimes they're called sparrowhawks is another name for American kestrels. Um, I find that um, that one has kind of fallen out of use a bit, um, but a lot of, if you have an older field guide, I know I have one field guide that's, I believe from the 1960s, where the American kestrel is labeled as a sparrowhawk. Um, so you might see some uh, names for them where people will call them sparrowhawks. Um, really named after their habit of hunting and eating things like sparrows, small birds. Um, names kind of fallen out of favor a little bit um, because we know that they are not hawks, so we'll call them American kestrels, so it's a little bit more clear that they are members of the falcon family instead of hawks, since there's a little bit of a difference between them. Falcons tend to be kind of aerial hunters looking for things that fly, like sparrows or small birds or those nice big crunchy insects. 
whereas hawks um, tend to be looking for more of your kind of ground animals, or you have some specialized hawks like your Cooper's hawks or your sharp shinned hawks who are going after small birds. So there are a couple, a couple differences there and a couple kind of physical differences to help them do those jobs. Somebody who's been seeing those large dragonflies in sandstone. Yeah, I've been seeing a couple of them. Um, for me, they, I see them every morning um, when I drive out from my garage because they like to sit on the kind of eastern part of my house and sit in the sun. When I'm leaving for work, I'll see them in the morning because they'll all be sitting there sunning. So I have a couple that like to hang out. So that's some good places to find them is usually in the morning. You'll find them kind of sitting in some bright sunny patches um, here over the next maybe month or so that they're passing through. You might see some more of those nice big dragonflies. Again, they're bright green. Um, oh, somebody was asking when we're supposed to take the hummingbird feeders down. There's some really good guidance on it. I would say the next couple of weeks. Um, I know that there's a really good date and I can't think of when that date is off the top of my head, but I'll quick look that up and I'll comment on that um, once we're done filming here. Once we're done maybe yelling about this food and hopefully eat some of it. Um, but I'll write the exact date because I know that there's a, a really good date that's like, ah, by this date is when you should be okay to take those down. But I will end of September. Yeah, I'll, I'll check that out and I'll, I'll add a comment in or see if I can find a good article on best timing. And it can change wherever you are in the US. Um, some of this is more kind of Minnesota centric. Um, whereas, I mean, they have some big crowds at feeders. If you were down in the southern part of the US or in other parts of the world, um, might be a little bit different. I know down in Texas, you have hummingbirds migrating through, through October, even November, might be hanging out year round. Um, so it might be a little bit different for you if you are further south, but I know up here in Minnesota, usually September or um, even through parts of October. So yeah, we'll, we'll drop an article in there. I know that there's been some really cool writing on kind of when to take those all down. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still giggling about the whole, <laughs> this whole uh, kind of mantling over his food situation. I would love for you to be able to see him actually eating, but just kind of turning around. I will point out he has this really lovely gradient between the kind of tan colors on his back and those kind of bright bluish gray wings. So uh, for American kestrels, they're one of the few raptors where the males and the females, or kind of the boys and the girls, look pretty different. Normally the best way to tell the difference between them is to actually just weigh them and see which one's bigger, since that's usually the female or the girl. Um, but American kestrels actually do have different colors. So he has these really kind of bright bluish gray wings and this kind of all brown tail with the kind of black stripe on the end. And so this back view is actually very helpful. Um, so the females tend to have kind of brown and black stripes on their wings and on their tails. So they're a lot more stripey. So that might help them camouflage or blend in a little bit better. So that way they're able to hide when they are kind of going in and out of those nest nesting sites. So nest boxes, holes in dead trees, things like that. They're able to camouflage a little bit better. Whereas the males here, a little bit brighter in color, maybe a little bit flashier. That might help them be able to better establish a territory of telling other American kestrels, hey, go away, this is our hunting range. Or being able to kind of lure away any predators away from that nest. All of those are really great reasons that usually you tend to see males being a little bit flashier in general for birds. So usually they have kind of a, a little bit different role of trying to show other animals where they are, whereas for um, whichever one of them is going to be sitting on the nest, it might be better for them to be a little bit better at hiding. So for American kestrels, that t tends to be the female who's those different colors. <laughs> well, at least we've stopped kind of vocalizing maybe been able to uh, hear for the for the person who's joining us who is just in one of our zoom meetings yeah we'll see if we can can I zoom in a little bit on this okay um for the person who was just in on the meeting they were asking me about if these birds make any noise so this is definitely kind of the noises that you might hear from an American kestrel there's this noise um they will also make kind of a louder kind of rapid kind of pitched noise that might be more of like an alarm call noise and then they are also able to make kind of a little trilling noise that I'll normally hear when they are kind of interacting with food or kind of expecting food or have kind of a piece of food. Not so much like this. It's more of like a little trilling noise. Like if you kind of roll your tongue, that kind of noise. Um, so it's another noise that, that they make, but 
what we're hearing now is maybe more of kind of, I have this piece of food, I'm excited to eat this piece of food, something like that. I'll see if there's any last few questions. I'll see, um, I'll see if after he's done, I can get a little video of him eating kind of from a different angle and I'll post that in the comments here as well. Cause I think if we are uh, done with some questions, I might end this now, let him get to work on eating a little bit and then I'll take a little video and see if we can post that in the comments. Um, since he's mostly just been turned around entirely <laughs> while we were reading and kind of now that we've been talking about him. Again, just making sure that piece of food stays safe. So this has been Maller, the American Kestrel, uh, holding on to a delicious mouse head um, and doing again that mantling behavior over it. We were reading If Frogs Made Weather. So this has been another Tuesday morning reading with raptors here at the Raptor Center. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more of what we've been up to on our online kind of learning and programming, you can check us out at theraptorcenter.org or there are links in this kind of Facebook page in our about section. Uh, you can check those out as well and stay tuned because we're gonna be posting more information about those. But thank you all so much for joining us and listening, certainly, to this American Kestrel here this morning. I'll see if I can get that video and that information about hummingbird feeders into the comments after this. So we will hopefully see you all next week, hopefully for a slightly warmer and sunnier edition of Reading with Raptors. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.